Hello and welcome to Jana's Studio, Story Nori's factual program where I talk to fascinating people about fascinating things. In this episode, we are looking into your mind. Have you ever had a fear? Are you afraid of the dark? Spiders? Meeting new people? Many of us have fears or anxieties that can make our palms sweat and our hearts beat faster. Sometimes they pass as quickly as they come over us. But some of us live with deeper fears called phobias. If you have a phobia, which is particularly strong, it can prevent you from leading a normal life. In a moment, I'm going to be talking to Andrew West, a psychiatrist who works with children and young people. I'm going to be asking him about phobias and how we can overcome them. This program will be especially interesting if you've heard my story called Fear. Spoiler alert! If you haven't heard the story already, listening on to this interview will give away some of the twists and turns of the plot. So it might be a good idea if you go back and listen to the story now. Anyway, here is a little extract from the story where our heroine Emily comes face to face with her greatest fear in life. There were those times when Emily was younger that she had tried to overcome her fear. She'd muster up the mental strength to venture out for a family walk and face her fear. But it usually ended in tears and a feeling of dismay. Daddy! Daddy, no! Quick! There's a dog coming! No! Help me! She shrieked. Just hold my hand. It'll be fine. Oh, no! no. It's off the lead! It's coming! And then she'd hold on to her dad for dear life heart beating fast until the owner and perfectly nice dog passed her. It had to be some distance away before she could let go of her dad's hand and breathe a sigh of relief again. And that was Richard Scott reading an extract from the story Fear. To help me understand more about phobias, I'd like to welcome my friend Andrew West. He is a doctor who specialises in treating emotional and psychological problems in young people up to the age of 18. I began by asking him what a phobia is. A phobia is a fear which is exaggerated and which stops you doing things that you very much want to do or need to do. We've all got things that we're frightened of and it's a jolly good thing that we do because you have to be frightened of some things. Yes. Because some things are dangerous. But it becomes a phobia if you are more frightened than you really need to be and if it gets in the way and stops you doing things. And that's why people have phobias? I think some people have hardwiring that makes their fear systems more reactive than others. If you've got a car that can get from naught to 60 in about four seconds or whatever it is, you have to be able to be fairly gentle with the controls. Mm. I think that some people have a system that can accelerate to a very high level of uh, fear and agitation and excitement and so on very, very quickly. But then I think also the experiences that you have can make a big difference. So I think if something very shocking happens to you, it can mean that you're more frightened than you need to be about Mm. certain situations later. Before we go any further... There are a couple of young Story Nori listeners here. Their names are Sophie and Elle. Hi, Sophie. Hi, Elle. So let's start with Sophie. Hi, Soph. How old are you? Hi, I'm seven years old. What would you like to ask Andrew? Hi, Andrew. I'd just like to ask you if you had a fear growing up or if you have one now. So, brilliant question. I was quite frightened of dogs, actually. That's one reason I like the fear story as well. I used to be quite frightened of dogs. I can remember running and then seeing a dog and slowing right down and walking. My mum used to be very afraid of dogs, but she's better now. I think it's because she had no choice, because she has too many dog-friendly people around her. I never had a pet when I was growing up. Some of my brothers and sisters had dogs. We didn't have dogs when I was a child. 
I think I would have been less frightened if we'd had dogs. OK, thank you, Andrew. And Elle, hi, how old are you? I'm eight years old. What would you like to ask Andrew? Hi, Andrew, I'd just like to ask you, if you weren't doing this job, what job would you be doing right now? I really, really don't know, but I love music. I wanted very much to be a violin maker at one time. I do wonder if that could have been a different life. And if, yeah, that's, that's one I think, I, I think about quite a lot, being a violin maker. My sister is afraid of spiders. What could help her to overcome it? That's a brilliant question. It goes right to the middle of what we're talking about, doesn't it, today, talking about fears and phobias. If your sister's afraid of spiders, it depends a lot how afraid she is. Can I ask you, does it stop her doing anything she wants to do? Not really, but sometimes when it's in her places that she wants to go, she might stop and, and call my mum. Yes, OK. So she might be worried about going into some place and she'd call your mum to help her. Yeah. It sounds to me as though she probably hasn't really got a phobia, but she's frightened of spiders. If she wants to be less frightened of spiders, basically she needs to spend more time with spiders. And she needs to probably do that gradually. It won't be helpful to her, probably, to suddenly have millions of spiders all over the place because she'd just be terrified, wouldn't she? <laughs> so she'd need to do it gradually. Well, thank you, Sophie and Elle, for some great questions. Andrew, what are the most common phobias that you see in children? I see social phobia quite commonly in children. What is social phobia? Social phobia is when you're frightened of social situations. It's quite common for children not to be very comfortable about uh, meal times at school, for example. Oh, wow. Um, and in some children, that is a phobia. And Would it stop them from going in? It could stop them from going in. It could stop them from going to school. And uh, quite often, alongside that, is fear of public transport, for example. This can be very handicapping, actually. It can make it hard for you to go shopping. Oh, I can imagine, uh, yeah. Hard for you to go to school, hard for you to go eat out in restaurants. Mm. That's quite a common one. What can you tell me about panic attacks? Panic attacks are times when your fear system is firing off very energetically. It prepares you to either fight something or to run away from something, and that makes the heart beat faster, it makes you breathe faster, and quite often it makes you want to go to the loo as well. Quite often those symptoms, those heart beating and so on, they make people more frightened and the more frightened they are the more they pant and more their heart beats and so that's yeah. a vicious circle it gets worse and worse and worse it reminds me of the story of emily when she wet herself accidentally yeah yeah absolutely because the last thing you want to be doing if you're running away from somebody is having to go to the loo so part of the animal response to fear is to get the loo thing out of the way as quickly as possible so that's how that can happen sometimes mm. that's not a typical part of a panic attack the most typical is Feeling like you're short of breath when right. actually you're breathing too much yeah. and feeling your heart beating too fast. And then because people breathe too much, it changes the chemistry in their blood. So then they can feel weird. They can feel lightheaded, like they might faint, or they can feel pins and needles sometimes around their mouth or in their fingers. And so they can feel weird. And of course, that's frightening too. I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> yeah. So how can you overcome a phobia? The key to overcoming a phobia is to stop the avoidance of the thing that you're afraid of. So what happens in a phobia is that you're so afraid of the thing that you will do everything to avoid it. Right. You'll take a long route to town or you'll never go into a certain room or there'll be a whole pile of things that you can't do, go on buses. It depends what the phobia is mm. of. The key to treatment, then, or the key to overcoming it, is stop the avoidance. I think that would take a lot of courage, maybe too much courage. You're right about courage. I think you do need a lot of courage yeah. to overcome mm. a phobia. It can be very, 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 very frightening. That's why usually it's helpful to start gradually and to start at little things. In your story about fear, yeah. you know, when Emily visited Heidi... Heidi had the puppy, didn't she? Yes. I seem to remember Heidi was holding the puppy. Yes, and Emily was, was Yeah, and Emily <laughs> was able to be in the hallway or something with them. Yeah. That was, in a way, starting gradually, because she knew that this was a small dog 
being controlled. Yeah. And she wanted to be with her friend. That's right, yeah. What if there isn't this heavy need to face your fear? In the story, Emily's worries about losing her friendship with Heidi really does outweigh her fear of dogs. So it kind of enabled her to face it. So what if for some people there isn't that incentive? Well, I think if there isn't that incentive, then it probably means that they don't need necessarily to treat their phobia. What you've just said about Emily's friend Heidi and her fear of losing her friendship with Heidi is really important. She found a fear that was even bigger than her fear of dogs in right. a way. Mm. So that gave her the motivation that she needed, the courage, if you like, yeah. that she needed. Just listening to this does give me a bit of a chill. For, for years, I remember I wouldn't allow myself to look at a picture of a snake or even see one in real life. What was worse, I couldn't even say the name of the creature. Um, I remember once I turned over a page in a magazine and there it was just jumping out at me, so I totally freaked out. I do remember the distress that I felt. I still remember it. This was years ago. But can you explain why you think it got so bad that I couldn't even look at one in a magazine or say the name? Well, for a start, snakes, and I hope it's all right me using the word, it'll, you know, kind of. if you're, you're, you're feeling uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. But in a way, we probably ought to make sure that we go on using the word mm. so that you don't become more frightened of it again. You know, right. In a sense, you need to practice it. Snakes are sometimes quite dangerous. I don't know how it started, but with the first fears, what you probably did then was you made sure you avoided that situation arising again. I did. Now, what happened was then, and I'm guessing, but you would have felt alarmed in a certain situation where you thought you might see a snake or have to say the word or somebody else mm. might say the word or something like that. And your anxiety would rise and that's uncomfortable. And then what you want is for your anxiety to drop. Yeah. You want it to go away. So what you did was you avoided that situation. You ran out of the room or you closed the book or you blocked your ears or you whatever, I don't know what you did, but you did something to reduce the anxiety. Mm. And that... Avoidance. <laughs> yes, that was avoidance, exactly. Yeah. And so I think in a way you became addicted to avoidance. You started to avoid more and more. And you avoided That's right. not just books, but also the word or, you know, all sorts of things. Actually, that really makes sense because the more I avoided it, it just got worse and worse. I couldn't yeah. even go to the zoo. And I also think there's a lot of people out there that are too too shy or embarrassed. So they say nothing and they're just living and suffering in silence, which is no good either. Yes. I know it sounds awful. And, and it's quite that, humiliating, actually. Well, I think that you said another important thing. I think people with phobias quite often feel very, very ashamed of them. And it's a great yeah. pity because it's absolutely natural in a way. We had to evolve with fears of snakes because if we hadn't been afraid of snakes, we'd have been stung by them all, bitten mm. or whatever the right word is, by yeah. them all the time. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. You're very welcome. What are the best and worst things that you can say to help someone with a phobia? One of the worst things is to make people feel more humiliated. I think that telling people that they're stupid or silly or, you know, snap out of it as though it's possible it doesn't to snap help. out of it. It doesn't help and no. I think it can make people feel worse. I think one of the best things to do is to explain that you don't share the fear yourself, but you understand that the other person is very frightened and you're going to stick around, you know. I'm not going to break off my friendship with you because of it or I'm not going to think less of you because of it. So I think that that just lets you know that not everybody is as afraid. I mean, of course, you know that, don't you? Yeah. But I, I think that it's helpful to see people around who aren't afraid, as long as they're not making fun of you or being horrible to you. So in the story, Heidi did the right thing then by getting a puppy, even though, you know, there was a kind of awkward moment where they're going to lose their friendship. Yes, and it's a great story, actually, because of that, I think. I think it was the right thing for Heidi to do for Heidi. No question, she wanted a puppy, didn't yes. she? Yes. So she really, really wanted a puppy. She did. And it would have been a great loss and a great shame, and she would have ended up hating Emily if she didn't have a puppy because of Emily. So, in a way, by doing what she wanted, not cruelly... No, um, it wasn't cruel. It wasn't cruel. But that way, at least she didn't have to hate Emily. She could go on liking Emily, actually. She, mm. if, if she had stopped herself having a puppy because of Emily, she would have been angry with Emily, and that would have been worse, really. She would have resented her, wouldn't yeah. she? Mm. If you do need support and help, sometimes that can be friends, 
uh, who can support you, and that may well be enough. Supportive parents who understand and don't help you to avoid all the time, mm. but they also they don't make you feel stupid and silly. It's difficult, though, isn't it? Because when you love someone, you care about their well-being, you do anything to, uh, as you say, parents or really good friends to support them in the way that the person wants, but it might not necessarily be good for them no. in the long run. No. So I think quite often anxious children have got anxious parents. That's a double problem because, <laughs> of course, you've inherited the hardwiring, maybe, but also then you may have a parent who's gets very panicky themselves around situations mm. and that's likely to make you as a child um, more wary of those situations yourself. A friend can help and then sometimes there are self-help books and there are computer programs that you can use and and then if you get really really stuck it can be important to have a psychologist or another professional mm. helping you and then yeah they, they can help you and I think that they help because it can be really tricky it's quite important to learn a way of relaxing. So one of the early things that um, I think a professional would do under these circumstances is to, is to teach somebody a relaxation technique of okay. some kind. And then somebody is more able to survive in an anxious situation. They don't need to run away so much because they so can calm themselves. Calm. And then what the psychologist will do is they will help you to make a list of all the things to do with, let's say, snakes um, or spiders or whatever it is, you know, everything to do with it. Make a list of all the things that bother you, all the situations that you avoid, that you really, really hate and that you're really anxious about. And then you make a ladder out of that list where the least troublesome things are at the bottom. The things Is it effective? You're... Does it work? Yeah. It does? Yeah, it does. It works really, really well. So you over, you, what you do is you overcome the fears at the bottom of the ladder and then you take a step up the ladder and overcome those fears. Right. Well, thank you so much, Andrew, for joining me today. I certainly find this topic very fascinating and very helpful. Thank you, Jana, for inviting me. It's been a great pleasure. We've covered a lot of things. We haven't said everything that could be said about phobias and fears, but it's a very, very important topic. And I think if this is helpful to people in some kind of way, then I'm delighted. Oh, wonderful. And a big thank you to Andrew for giving us his insights into fears and phobias. Andrew has written articles, tweets and blogs about mental health. His book, called Being With and Saying Goodbye, is written for adult reading and is about how he thinks professionals could be better at helping, not just children, but everyone, including each other. The links to his book and blog are on the website. I hope you've enjoyed this programme and please do remember, if you find Story Nori interesting, it would be wonderful if you can support us on Patreon. As ever, your support is highly appreciated. Even a dollar a month will help keep our show on the road. Until next time, take care, and thanks for listening. From me, Jana, at storynori.com. Bye! <laughs>